Great. Well, good night, everybody. Or good morning. Hello. What? We're Hi. here. We're here. We had pizza, so we have like a full <laughs> belly. Presenting on a full stomach is going to be good. <laughs> My name is Sally Darby. I'm a senior strategist at Frog Design here in San Francisco. Uh, and I've been very blessed to get to spend a lot of my career at Frog doing design research. So in the past year or so, I've been to Tokyo and Japan where I've gotten to spend some time researching the future uh, of retail uh, and what that's gonna look like in a couple years. Uh, I've gotten to spend time in people's homes, getting to hear about their experiences living with chronic diseases, which has been really special. Uh, and right now I'm working on a project where I'm getting to explore what the future of insurance might look like. Great, and I'm Christina Phillips. I'm also a strategist with Frog. Um, and as Sally uh, kind of alluded to in her introduction, um, my favorite thing at Frog, what we get to do, is imagine when hi clients hire us to imagine the future of something. So they always come to us and it's, what's the future of healthcare? What's the future of work? Um, but I get really excited about that because we get to talk to experts that are leading in that field. We get to scrape through trends and try to develop a point of view. Um, and we get to like dive really deep into data to try to figure out what a white space in that field may look like for our clients. Um, so a little bit about the research that we've been doing lately. So we are so excited to be here tonight. Uh, and we want to kick off with what hopefully will be kind of a fun, easy question. Oh, we have a clicker. Oh, yeah. Let's use that. that. So our question for you is, what is design research? And we're going to ask you to play along with us for a second. So raise your hand if you think design research includes user interviews. All right. So that's, I'm seeing a majority over here. OK. Keep your hands up. I know it's exhausting, but we're getting a workout in. Raise the roof. It's been a long day. Yeah. What about expert interviews? Keep your hands up if you agree with us. Yeah? OK. Intercepts? Street intercepts? Put your hands down when you s stop agreeing with us. Okay, Video ethnographies. OK, still most people. These okay. people are getting tired. <laughs> how about observation? OK, okay a few yep. more hands coming up. Focus groups. OK, some hands dropping. Put your hands down if you disagree, up if you agree. How about desk research? OK, all right. Some discussion about that one. What about user testing? OK, more hands went up for that one. I see you over there raising your hand. Thank you. How about data mining? Uh, some okay. more wobble, discussion. Some wobbly hands over here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what about surveys? Okay. Okay. Well, about half now. People in the back are, have gotten tired, or they disagree with us. What about conjoint analysis? Yes. Okay. We got a guy in the green sticking his hand way up for conjoint analysis. Never seen anybody that excited for that. So thank you. <laughs> and how about Max Diff? Oh, green did shirt did not ew? put up for Max Diff. Someone said ew for Max <laughs> Diff. It's so rude. SWOT analysis? Okay, hands right. back No, okay. people are tired. Okay. <laughs> Competitive <laughs> analysis? Okay. All right, all right, all right. You guys get the point. So this was really a trick question from us because in our minds, all of this is design research because all of this helps us understand and break apart really complex design problems. And it's only when you do that that you can really start designing solutions to problems um, and solutions that people love. So how do you wrap your head around a complex design problem? Well, we love to think about this parable, which is the parable of the blind men and the elephant. And the story goes that there was a group of blind men and they came across an elephant and they never came across an elephant before, so they didn't know what an elephant was. And so they all started touching the elephant to understand it. And some of them touched the trunk, some touched the tusk, some of them touched the back of it. And then they came back together and they tried to describe what an elephant was. And the people who touched the trunk thought it was maybe a water hose. And some people touched the this, this smooth tusk and they thought it was maybe a water spigot. And some people touched the back and they said, mm, I think it's like a big flat wall. And so because they'd all touched different parts of it, because they had all come at it from different angles, they all had a really different understanding of what an elephant was. So we like to think about big, hairy design problems, just like this elephant. If you approach it from one angle and just use one different or one research methodology, you'll never understand what the elephant is. So tonight, we want to very broadly define design research as any research that helps to inform inspire and guide design solutions. And it's only when you figure out how to combine and bring in different methods that you can really start to understand complex problems and design solutions that people love. 
Great. Thanks, Sally. So we are going to walk you through three different examples from frog work, real frog work, but not disclosing client names, um, today around these three themes, inspire ideas, inform design, and guide execution. And we're going to challenge some assumptions. Uh, some of these assumptions include that qualitative research is better at the beginning in order to inspire your ideas, where quant is better at the end in order to validate. Um, so we're going to talk through how we've blended these different methodologies in order to come up with the best, best approach to build stuff that people really love. So the first example that I'm going to take you through is one where we have used research to inspire ideas. So about, oh man, a year and a half ago now, us frogs got really curious about weed. Um, that might not come as a surprise to some of you, um, but we had a provocation. We wanted to understand, as cannabis was becoming legal in California, what it might take for cannabis to not only be legalized, but reach mainstream adoption, become normal, reduce the stigma. So in order to do that, we wanted to learn more about people's perceptions of cannabis. We wanted to learn about why they harbored stigmas. We wanted to learn more about what motivated them. But we didn't want to learn that just in California, where we were comfortable. We wanted to learn that nationwide. So we put out a global survey, and we started to investigate some hypotheses around what the biggest drivers of an individual's perceptions towards cannabis, what, what were some relationships. So we tested a bunch of different things. We tested, does political affinity affect cannabis perception? So you can start to see this is where the presentation gets boring because I included screenshots from SPSS. <laughs> um, so I, we started to ask people about political affinity, but we didn't want to ask, right? Because depending on people to report something, especially in quantitative surveys, sometimes not so reliable. So we asked them a series of questions about how they raised children. Um, I'm seeing some nods here. So a psychologist in Massachusetts identified a few years ago, I think it was 2017 before our president got elected, he wanted to understand um, what people's relationships were to obedience and creativity and how that could indicate whether or not that they were, that they were tending towards more authoritarian leadings. All that being said, we asked people, um, in your view, is it more important for children to be obedient or to be self-reliant, be curious or well-mannered? be considerate or well-behaved. So we observed them through quantitative research in order to discuss their political leaning. Well, there was no effect really between political leaning, this question, and cannabis perception, though it was really fun to put together. We also wanted to see if attitudes toward, te toward technology um, had any bearing on whether or not people accepted cannabis and thought it should be legal. So we asked about uh, technology adoption. Are you a really fast technology adopter? Are you slow? Do you like to see other people adopt technology before you do? Again, not very strong parallels. We also asked about wellness habits. We thought maybe people that like to do yoga and chill like, might be more accepting of cannabis. Not too much relation there either. Um, but we tested all these things, right? We ran different clusters because we were digging for things. We wanted to understand what, what was landing. And then we found it. Um, so 93% of people who know a cannabis consumer believe it should be legal, compared to 74% who don't know anyone. So over and above political leaning, we also tested geography, technology adoption, wellness. It was people in your network, whether or not you knew someone that consumed cannabis, that really humanized it and made it approachable for people. Um, and that was really powerful. I think if we had gone straight into research, we wouldn't have known to ask that. Um, so we took this learning and we went into uh, qualitative research. We did interviews in people's homes. It's a photo of us interviewing someone in the mission. And we had her build out her trust network. We said, okay, put out on tiles for us who you consume cannabis with. Who knows about your cannabis consumption? Who would you never tell about your cannabis consumption? And we asked her what it would take for her to move in and out of these circles. What would she need to do? What would need to be true in order for her to feel comfortable expanding her network? Because we knew that's how people we bring other people into the category. It also helped us ideate around ideas at retail, it helped us throw concepts on a wall and say, okay, what would it look like for um, us to build communities for cannabis inside digital and physical spaces? So being able to start our qualitative research with a little bit of a seed, an indication of what was happening nationwide, was really powerful. 
So when researching what people need in a completely new market, as you saw from the way we tried to phrase our questions, you can't directly ask what people want. They're not going to be able to tell you. It's our job as researchers to be able to go in and make some observations about people's behaviors and test to see different groups and to understand their motivations at a deeper <laughs> level. And even though you might not think that quantitative research can be a tool at this, at this stage, by being able to expand methods of observation can lead to much richer inspiration actually before you go in field. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. So the next example I'm going to share is from some client work that we did about a year ago. Uh, and this was around informing design. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we were working with a company that you can think about like the Uber of facilities maintenance, which sounds very boring. Uh, but basically what that means is they're a double-sided market. So on one side, they have companies like Starbucks or McDonald's, fast food restaurants that have really complicated equipment that they need um, to repair pretty often. And on the other side, they have a group of service providers, so people that are electricians, plumbers, contractors, who they can hire to do that work. And they connect the two markets. And they wanted to understand how could they design better experiences for that network of service providers. But there was one problem, and that was that they didn't have a great sense of who that network of service providers were. So they came to us to understand who are these people, what are their needs, and then what are some things that we can design for them. We knew that we were going to do both a quantitative study and also a qualitative research study. So we wanted to start by grounding our research in the same foundation. So we did desktop research to understand the competitive landscape, uh, what were the needs of these people who were service providers, what was being offered to them currently. And we used that to create, again, this survey, and then also our qualitative research materials, which was great because we knew ultimately we were going to need to map the data back to one another. So one back. <laughs> um, so we uh, sent our survey on its way, and we went into the field. And we met with service providers in their places of work, um, and we got to understand uh, how they were doing their work, what their pain points were, and we also got to sit with them and co-create concepts. So we came in with a seed idea, like, what would a smart service truck look like? And then have them tell us, I hate that idea, or I love that idea, or here's what I would do to make that idea better. And as we were working with them, we started to see patterns in our conversations, which really led us to understand that there were three main groups or types of service provider. And those were the green thumb. These are small lifestyle businesses that are really established. The cultivators, which are growing businesses that are trying to partner and, and find new markets. And then the preservationists, which are kind of old businesses that have been around for a long time uh, and really are well established. And we were particularly excited about the green thumbs because when we had met with them in field, they were the people that seemed to have the most needs, the juiciest needs that we could solve for what felt like really um, quickly. But before we started designing, we knew we needed to understand, uh, get a sense of our scale. How prevalent were the green thumbs in this service network? So we went to our data. And what our data told us is actually the green thumbs are really the smallest segment. They are the least active in the network. They required the most hand-holding. They were the least likely to be loyal to our client. And they were also the most dissatisfied. You can see in kind of this word cloud analysis we did and also in this bar chart, which shows their dissatisfaction level just extremely higher than the rest of the segments. So unfortunately, although we were very excited to design for the green thumbs, we realized it was in the best interest of our client if we actually decided to focus on the cultivators and the preservationists. So if you go to the moral of the story, it's really important to go deep in your research, but you have to always keep scale in mind. And sometimes, even if you're really excited about idea, an idea, you're going to have to put it on the shelf and wait for it um, to have a better time to come to life. So I will bring it home with our last example, which is how you can combine research methodologies, methodologies in order to guide your execution. Um, so our client came to us and said um, they really wanted to create and launch a disruptive workplace collaboration product. They're in the telecommunication space. And we were like, wait, you know about Slack and uh, Gmail and all these other things? And they were like, yeah, 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 okay. Um, so it was our job. It's a very crowded market, and it was our job to go out and figure out how we could create a disruptive workplace collaboration product for them. 
So first we started and we did some inspirational visits. So this is a, a picture of us visiting dynamic land out in Oakland. Um, so we wanted to understand maybe the future of work, let's challenge our assumptions that it's all digital and we're holograms. Like maybe we revert back to paper and everything's in person. Like what would that look like and how would that affect the way that we connect with each other? So we did that. Um, we went out into field. This is us in a really remote office park outside of Chicago. We also visited Munich and London and trying to understand um, what are those user needs that aren't being met by all the technology services out there today. So this is an example of an activity where we put together some spectrums. And we asked people to map where they were working currently and where they'd like to be. So some examples of the spectrums included alone or in a group. Are you spontaneous? Are you planned? Why aren't you as planned as you'd like to be? What kind of tools could help you get there? So we conducted activities and interviews to help us get to our concepts. So this is a picture of our project space during that time. Um, so on this side, you can see all of our interviews. And then this side, you can see the typical synth board where we started to map out and draw our concepts. And we were pretty confident that we were developing some hot shit. Like, we thought people were going to love these concepts. Um, but then we realized that throughout research that our users weren't the only ones that had to love our solution. So with our telecommunications clients, um, they were selling to IT decision makers, they were selling through channel partners, there was a bunch of different players involved that would affect ultimately whether or not our product got into the hands of users, the people that we wanted to use these products. So we conducted a global survey where we presented a variations of our concepts that emphasize different features. And we tested this with IT managers, we tested with users, and then with channel partners. And we were able to understand, though the root of our idea remained the same, um, oops, oh, I'll just talk to that. Um, this is what happens when you work on online keynote. Um, so we were able to understand, even though the root of our idea remained the same, that um, there are different things that we could emphasize for different audiences. So while IT managers cared more about the ability to test the tool quickly, partners wanted to make sure that it could integrate with existing solutions, users just wanted it to be super easy. So we could sell those different concept, those different features of our concept in marketing materials and in our go-to-market strategy. And ultimately, this really helped us create something that we knew that users would love, but then also our product wouldn't be just deckware. You know, we wouldn't develop a concept booklet that would sit in someone's office, but we would instead develop a go-to-market strategy that complemented that product and ensure that our client could get it into the hands of people that were responsible for selling it to them. So that was a really important way we used research in order to guide our execution of our ideas. So we share these three examples because we want to ultimately talk about something that is kind of obvious. Oh, there's that slide. Um, and that is that as designers, we have to find ways to look at problems from different angles. So we have to find, through these different methodologies, different ways of touching the elephant, because it's our job to make things that people love. Um, and sometimes that's really uncomfortable. Oftentimes we fall back on our own methodologies, things that we're used to working with, or we're kind of pushed into decisions from the internal stakeholders that we're managing or from our clients, because maybe you need data in order to back up a decision, a really rich nugget that you heard in a qualitative interview. So we need to be bold in making these kinds of recommendations and ultimately um, contributing to the product creation. So I think the best advice we can leave you with is have fun, go forth, explore different ways of solving problems and figuring them out, and just experiment. Have fun. Great. Thank you. Thank you.